Well, good morning, y'all. Did you guys have a great week? You got to go outside, slosh around in the puddles. I think there may have been some sun. But it was a good week, no? Yes? Awesome. Well, the plates are getting passed. I encourage you to, again, remember we give out of obedience to give back to God for what he's given to us. Truly is, again, a form of worship as we move through this worship service and the different aspects of it and just truly giving praises to God for all that he's done for us. So with that, while the paints are coming around, I want to encourage you with some announcements. Last week, we talked about the mission trip to the Dominican Republic, and they were going to have hoodies and sweatshirts for sale. Um, don't forget, you can purchase those. They're going to put the order in tomorrow, so you don't want to miss out. They are super soft. If you like really soft things to hug you, they are the thing to get. All right? That is going to take place tomorrow. Other than that, we do have February coming up. We have a big announcement for you because we want to invite you out to our prom palooza. And I know what some of you are thinking, I didn't like prom in high school. I didn't go to prom in high school. Or even the fact I don't have a date for prom because I understand that for different generations, when you mention prom, that's what you automatically go to, right? Know this. This is a party that we're going to have, okay? We just didn't want to say party, so we fancied it up with prom palooza. Now, some people have asked their spouses to come. I know there's some spouses still waiting to be asked. Hint, hint. Because you can't go if you don't ask somebody. It's going to be really awkward when they leave that day and go to the party without you. So you can sign up for it. We need you to sign up. It's going to be a great time. The tickets include dinner because if you go to prom, you have to go to dinner, right? And we picked the fanciest place to go to for dinner. We're going to Barnhill's Buffet. Yes, it's going to be great. And then the party afterwards, and I would tell you more about the party, but um, I want you to come. Yes. I'll mention there's balloons, there'll be food and drinks, and there will be music, and it'll be a great time for all. So get your tickets, sign up. Don't just sign up. Get your tickets if you need to. Um, if you don't have the Church Center app on your phone, download it. You can go through that way, or you can talk to Amy in the Connect Center after service, and she will be more than glad to get you helped out with that. Because um, we want to see you all come. And to be honest, I just want to see what happens when you get all of you in a room and a DJ starts playing music to what happens. <laughs> um, so it's going to be great. So those are the things coming up. There is the newsletter for February. I encourage you to get that as well. It's going to be a great month. So with that, that's all the announcements, I think. Yeah, sure. Let's just go with it. Um, Let's go ahead and continue into our series. Uh, before we do that, let's go ahead and pray and just come back into that posture before the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, truly, you are a great God. And God, as we look at what you would have for the church and the church to be and the things we do, we just pray that you would guide us in this time. We ask for the conversation to lead us to understand the church and what we do and why we do it at church. And not just out of tradition or out of just checking the boxes, but we'd be reverently seeking you, coming before you, falling on our faces to worship you and grow in who you would have us to be, Lord. So, Lord, we thank you for this time, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would be with each and every one of us, that you would remove distractions, that you would help our ears to hear the truths that you have, have our hearts be ready to receive those truths so that we can work on them throughout this week and grow in who you would have, Lord. Lord, I pray I would not be a distraction, but I would speak your words, your truth, that you have. And Lord, truly, we are amazed by what you do for each and every one of us, Lord. And we love you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, we'll continue our series, Church, Why We Do the Things We Do at Church. And today's topic would be one that I would say would split a church. You know, there's hard topics like giving and membership and some other ones along those lines. But when it comes to worship, I've seen many churches split over this because of the ideas, the concepts, the traditions that this should be in place. And we all know what happens when a church gets into a mindset of a certain way of doing things. If someone offers something new, what's the response? We've never done it this way before. Yeah. Are you looking for a problem? And the next worst thing besides worship and songs would be carpet color. But we'll get to that on a different day and time. So today, we're going to continue our series. The title of the message is, Why Do We Sing? We're going to be in Psalms 150 as you make your way there. 
And as you're thinking about this, you're like, all right, the pastor's finally going to set down the style and mode of worship that we should be playing and singing in church. We'll see about that. I just want to leave you on the edge of that one. Because truly, as we know, there's songs and types of songs that could be sang, and there's everyone's little preference. But what does God have to tell us about singing? As we've looked so far in this series, we've gotten the straight view of what baptism and communion are. And we'll be celebrating that today as a great opportunity. We looked at giving and church membership. And last week, we looked at fellowship. And fellowship made this change because it's now directed towards each of us and where we start with God and how that affects the church, which is the same thing that we have to say about worship and singing, is it starts with us and God. If you would agree with me, you would say that there's something amazing about singing. There's power in singing. Would you agree? Amen. To be honest with you, across all levels of the social sciences, sciences they say music does something to the human being physically, emotionally, and spiritually. If we are honest about ourselves when we hear music, we could tell you that, yes, music drives us, right? We could be in a funk, and we can listen to some great music, and it lifts our spirits. At that same point in time, we could be in a good mood and get into the car and put on that music that can enrage us to be a really nice driver, maybe, <laughs> or get us there quickly, it can affect us. We can play songs that can bum us out. We can play songs that simply can energize us to be a happy person. Which is why, if we're honest, we all have many playlists, do we not? Like our workout playlist. You're not going to have a slow playlist for working out, are you? Unless you want to do the mile in 10, uh, 27 minutes, then yes, you have a slow playlist, right? At the same point in time, you have a different playlist for driving, especially depending on the traffic, right? Because sometimes we need to calm ourselves because of the people around us. Other times it's wide open, so it's just going to be fun. There's even the relaxing playlist, a bedtime playlist, and you may even have a worship playlist. And you play these at just the specific right time to help direct you and to kind of push you into a right season of being. They help us get through the moments or moments of life. Music is all around us. We walk into a store, we hear music, right? We go to the doctor's office, we hear music. Even in the most confined of space, the elevator, we hear music. It's crazy because my kids love to watch musicals, and musicals interests are interesting to me because I don't understand how they relate to normal life. At random times, everyone just bust out into singing and dancing. Has anyone ever seen that happen? Yes. <laughs> Besides Sunday morning at Marshall Road Baptist Church and at the Meadows House and my house, it happens. But my favorite musical, which is funny because it's not a musical in the sense of musicals, is based upon the music that's going on all around in the whole movie. And the musicals, of, the movie's called American Graffiti. And it's not about the fact of the songs that they're singing, but it's the music that is playing that is kind of directing what is taking place. And when it comes to music, music directs us just like that. Not only is music played everywhere, then we come to church and we get to sing. And there's music, and depending on the era, and I do say era, that you grew up, it shapes how you worship God. The songs that you sing or even don't sing. And the challenge has gone before shaping us in our Sunday morning services when it comes to worship. And oftentimes, everyone has their opinion of worship. Some voice their opinions. Others just stand there like this. But we all know where we stand when it comes to worship. And maybe as you've come into church and you've been even in church for a long time, you've asked the question, why do we sing? And maybe you've got an answer of, well, that's what David did. Okay, I guess I can agree with that. Or they point you to other aspects of scripture, or they just tell you that's what we do. And you're like, all right, that's what we do. Today, we're going to see 
how singing truly is important. And it's important to God, and it's a serious conversation and topic for God. And I know what you're thinking, Roy, how do you know that singing is important to God? Well, as I read through scripture, you know when God wants to make a point about something, you know what he does? He repeats it. Much like how when you're dealing with your kids, you repeat yourself, right? Well, God goes to the point of repeating himself so much in the scriptures about worship that he mentions it 400 times. 400 times that we are to sing. And guess what? 50 of those 400 times are commands to sing. Now, I want to put a disclaimer out there because I want us to understand and to be on the right page. We don't serve a God who is like, oh my goodness, life is difficult. I need man to worship me right now so that I feel better about myself. That is not the God of the Bible, all right? Do we understand that? At that same point in time, God does not need our praises. That, again, is not the God of the Bible. The God we serve, the God we love, wants us to praise him, which is why he created us to praise him. So as we look at this, one of the areas where God talks about singing, and he mentions it, is in Psalms 150. It's six verses. And I have to say this disclaimer, and I know what's going to be said to me afterwards, but this is where we go to, and it's funny because all denominations or non-denominations will sit there and look at it and go, so what's wrong with that group over there? Because it says right here what we're supposed to do. So if you read with me, Psalms 150, picking up in verse 1, it says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him in his mighty acts. Praise him according to excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of trumpets. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the thrimble and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So if you run into those stuck up Baptists, you can say right here, well, evidently, drums are allowed on the stage. Guitars are allowed on the stage. Tambourines are loud on the stage, and loud voices. We're all to make a joyful sound. Some of us don't make a joyful sound. We just make a sound, but that's speaking to me. So as we look at the why do we sing, and we look at this apart, I want to look at three things that point us back to God. And the first aspect of why we sing is we sing to remember, all right? <clears throat> We sing to remember what God has done and what he will do for us. Throughout scripture, when God talks about this topic, he reminds us that he has done great things for us. We sang this morning of the great things God has done for us, which is equivalent to what God did with Moses and the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 31. And at this time, God is having a conversation with Moses. It's a sweet time where they're communing back and forth. And God is actually preparing Moses to understand that the people that he is leading are stubborn. They're a little bit ornery. And guess what? They're going to deny God. And they're going to want to do their own thing. And Moses is like, what are you talking about? They seem like a pretty nice group of people. In doing so, God tells Moses what's going to come. And he tells them this in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 21. And he says, and, many, and when many troubles and afflictions come to them, this song will testify against them because their descendants will not have forgotten it. For I know that they are prone to do even before I bring them into the land I swore to give them. So God understood that they were going to get into hard times. He understands that we're going to get into hard times. So he's going to do something in order to help us stay on the right track. And what he does is he talks to Moses and Moses goes into the next chapter and writes a sermon for the people to remember. But guess what he writes it to? Music. You guys aren't going to get that from me, okay? It would just be horrible. But Moses does this. He writes this song, this tribute for them to focus on and to understand of what God has done for them and to remind them of his greatness and what he did bringing them out of the land and what he's going to do in taking them to the promised land. But guess what? He doesn't just do it for that generation. He does it in a way where he's going to put it on the hearts of their children because we all know what children are really great at doing, right? Reminding us of just who we are sometimes and those moments we forget 
And he uses this song, this sermon, in a way to bring glory to himself, but to keep it at the ever front of their mind of what God does for them. This works the same way for us today. When we come together and we sing joyful songs of praises, in those times when we're struggling or we're weak, we hear the praise songs and we remember just who our God is and the great things that he has done for us. We're confronted with songs like Amazing Grace or Death Was Arrested, and we're taken back to those moments that we were confronted by God, but comforted by God at the same point in time. And it's when we do that, we remember his glory and how great he is for the things that he has done for us and his comfort to us. And then we sing. And there's an integral part here about singing because we all can sing show tunes from any show from the 60s forward, can we not, without ease? Okay, it's just me that has Gilligan's Island stuck in my head right now. (laughs) But we can sing in a praise song, a worship song to God. It's one thing to just simply sing the words from our head, to repeat them back. It's a different thing, though, when it comes from the heart. Because when it comes from the heart, it's felt. And it makes that connection that drives us to a point. But we have to be careful. Because all so often, when worship plays, we'll tend to make an emotional connection. And God isn't looking for an emotional connection. Because emotional connection removes the heart. And it messes with the head. Because then we're not drawing near to him. We're simply just remembering how wretched we are without God. We have to have that connection of the heart and the head. Or better yet, C.S. Lewis put it the best way when he said, praise is understanding what is true and then expressing it in praise. Basically, when we know the truth, what do we do? Sing the truth. We proclaim it to God. So, The first thing we do is we sing to remember what God has done and will do for us. The second thing that we see that we are to do when it comes to worship is we are to sing to learn about God. For the encouragement of this, we find this in Paul's letters to the churches. And in both the letters to the the Colossae church as well as the Ephesus church, Paul encouraged the people with singing. He said this in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. He said, Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. He mirrored the same words over in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, when he said to them, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. So if we take this, Technically, I guess we are supposed to be living in a musical if we're honestly singing and encouraging, right? So, that's going to make it really interesting this week through all of your homes and even at work, especially when you bust out a song. God is encouraging us not just to take the word, not just to share it, but to sing it. Make that connection and to learn who he is. We should be men and women saturated in God's word, meaning that when it comes up to those interactions, those moments, it should come out of us, like a song comes out of us, which means we have to know what it says. We have to be reading and understanding and pulling it in so we can learn who he is and just how great he is for each and every one of us. And when it comes to worship music, and especially in the church, Worship can say a lot about the church. So much so that I totally agree with Gordon Fee's line when he says, show me a church's songs and I'll show you their theology. That rings truth. Because what we sing is who we are and understand, but it's showing us who God is. And we'll be honest, this Sunday or any other Sunday, as the week goes on, typically if you reflect on the week, are you going to remember the sermon? Maybe not, but I can guarantee at least at one point throughout that week, you'll remember one of the songs that was sung. And it'll be in that moment when life is interesting for you. You may wake up on your lips of singing, this is the day, 
or as you're going through different situations, it's reminding you of the peace and the glory that he has for you. So as we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, we sing with passion and the truth of God, learning who he is and sharing who he is to those around us. So we sing to remember what God has done for us and will do for us. We sing to learn who God is. And the last thing that we learn and we do is we sing to set free the power of God. Now, this one might sound a little bit crazy, and you're thinking, okay, Roy, where are you going with this? Are we going to pop up and all get crazy? No. Listen for a minute with me as we unpack this. I told you guys I love hearing testimonies. I love hearing people's stories of how they came to Christ or even returned and came back around. And I've sat through many and listened, and I love when they start out this way. You know, I was having one of those days. I didn't know what to do as I was driving around. And for some reason, I felt the urge to pull into the parking lot of the church. And I sat there for a minute, not knowing why. And as I sat there, I heard music coming from the buildings. And for some reason, it drew me in. And I got up and I came into church and there was singing. And there was joy. The problem was I was battling addiction. I was battling anger. I was battling my flesh. I was battling what seemed to be a lost cause. But as I came in, I heard the people. I heard the words. And for some reason, a peace fell upon me. And that day, I can't explain it, but as I sat there in that seat, I could clearly hear the message that was spoken. And why was that? Because God's power was set free. Singing has the ability to reach least God's power to each and every one of us. As Christ followers, we face struggles and the things that we go through. But as God shapes us and he molds us in his image, he has that way of drawing it back. And sometimes it's simply with a song. A song being sang. We struggle, yes. And sometimes we feel far from God. Our attitude may not be there. Our hearts may not be at the right place. It may be dark. But have you ever heard that song? that took and changed your focus, allowed you to sit there and go, wait a minute, I have hope. I am a child and God loves me. What does he want to do with me? And those are the amazing things that happen. And if you're thinking that's impossible, Roy, there's no way that happens. Guess what? It's full of it in here showing us those stories. And one of the best ones that I could think of and look to is that of Solomon or not Solomon, King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now, Saul had become king and there had been some different issues in his life and it came to a point of his life where things got a little bit difficult. And it says in chapter 16, verse 14, that now a spirit of the Lord had left Saul and an angry spirit was sent from the Lord began to torment him. So Saul's servant said to him, you see an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord Command your servants here in your presence to look for someone who knows how to play the lyre. Whenever the evil spirit comes to you, that person can play the lyre and you will feel better. So Saul's getting this counsel from one of his servants, right? I like what happens here in verse 17. In verse 17, it says, Then Saul commanded his servant, Find me someone who plays well and bring him to me. Had to be Saul's idea, right? He's one of those guys. I had this idea. I know it'll help me out. How about you get me someone that can play music well? I just said that. You ever had one of those days? Yeah. But it goes on in verse 18. One of, the, one of the young men answered, I have seen the son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is a valiant man, a warrior, eloquent, handsome, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul dispatched messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David who is with the sheep. In verse 21, it says, when David came to Saul, he entered his service. Jumping down to verse 23, we read, And when the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would pick up the lyre and play, and Saul would would then be relieved, feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. For much of us, sometimes when we get into that funk, we get into that dark spot, all we simply have to do is just adjust the song, change the station. And when we hear that worship song, it pulls us back into the place that God would have us. 
This is just one of many accounts with people. But did you know music gives victory in other ways too? And one of the greatest victories that Israel ever faced with music was the Battle of Jericho. A battle that made no sense by all means because what did they do? They walked around the town in silence seven days. And on the seventh day, after they marched around seven times, they blew the trumpet and the walls fell down. God gives victory in many ways. And when it comes to worshiping him and singing, when we sing, it releases the power of God to do mighty things amongst each and every one of us. We've been in our seasons, I'm sure, where we've been distressed and it's that song or that new song that we find that pulls us back to the place to be able to worship and to see him be at work. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit through God's power reaching each and every one of us. So as we look at this, why do we sing? The question for the so what, it's one that's directed specifically to you. And I could probably go into a lot of reasons in asking this and giving them to you is why do I sing at church? You may say you sing because you want to be heard over everyone else. You may say that you sing because simply it's the greatest thing to do. You may say I don't sing because I've been told not to sing. <laughs> Some of us have that problem. But rather than reflecting on the negative, we'll go back to the simple basis of why do we sing? And they are simply what we have seen so far. We sing to remember what God has done and will do for us. We sing to learn who God is, and we sing to set free the power of God. And it's in those reasons we sing that our singing truly is praises to him. I want to pause for a minute, and I want to do something a little bit different that would normally happen during this time, because as you guys know, I am not the greatest musician. I'm not even a musician at all. Um, I have a good friend of mine that told me, hey, Roy, it's okay that you don't sing and you don't do that. You have other gifts. I said, that was nice for a Christian to say to me. No, I'm just playing. Um, I tell him, you're right. And I'd rather be in the right place than be in the wrong place. So what I want to do is I want to invite up our friendly neighborhood worship leader, Pastor Rue. So Rue's going to come up here and we're going to have a conversation with you guys to kind of set the mood and understand why we sing here at Marshall Road Baptist Church. Because as much as I could say it, it might come with a little bit more weight because this guy's the guy that actually leads you in worship. Amen? Amen. 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 So, are you ready? I think so. All right. Let me pull up. I'll do it this way. So we got a few questions because they keep us on track. He forgot his answers. I did. Just no, playing. I forgot my notes. I know. Because two dyslexic people and then one who stutters is never a good, never a good TED talk unless we have notes in front of us. And time. Because this time, could go on forever. Yeah, that's true. Oh, in that case, let us pray. No. Yeah. <laughs> I can throw it in there. All right. Had to do it. I know. Yeah. It's all good. <laughs> I'm down. I love Ruth. I love Ruth's heart for worship. Oh, really? as, as we've talked and understood, truly, he is the worship leader. Um, and he goes through that and he does a well, good job, great job of that. And, and I love him for that because we could balance out the worship service. So with that, some of you guys know Rue. Some of you have been around Rue for a bit, but understanding who Rue is when it comes to worship, can you just give us that kind of like background short story of why worship for you? Short. Short, short, story. short story. Yes. Short that wasn't a stutter or uh, dyslexic. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So I've been a part of church music and worship for uh, over 20 years now. Um, my stepdad is a pastor, and so you know, I always grew up in, in church ever since uh, him and my mom was married. And uh, I mean, I started, remember, just learning a G chord and playing Give Me Oil in My Lamp. For the ones. Yeah. Party and burning. And burning. <laughs> yeah. That's my singing crew. I'm gonna looking at y'all. Um, and I started out with that, but it was actually when I was 11, I started to dive into... Uh, actually playing in, in church, what it, what it actually meant, a little, little of that weight, but uh, one, of my favorite, one of my favorite quotes that keeps me kind of humbled and centered is from Kevin Venable. It says, shallow knowledge will never produce deep expressions of worship. Amen. Um, and so just understanding that I was a very early age, I never fully grasped. It. So my expression of worship was very shallow. And so 
you'll, um, as I talk, you'll see that something starts to expand a little more. So when I was 17, I surrendered to the ministry, and I wanted to give my life to Christ. Every aspect, my time, my energy, my focus, my ideas, my words, however broken they are, he has them. Um, and again, just shallow expression, or, you know, shallow knowledge, expression of worship. Um, I started going, oh, yeah, worship is a part of that. Yeah, worship. What, so what does that look like? And so I started diving deeper and then even went to my first staff position in 19, being a student and worship interim pastor. And to the point that uh, God, even though God was telling me, like, hey, listen, I know, I know you love students, but you were never meant to be a student pastor. And I praised him. Um, <laughs> love you guys. Love you guys. Um, we may have hearts of students, yeah. but sorry, we found other leaders. I was, I was never meant to be in student ministry. Sorry, love you guys. Um, but he was called. He, he was called. He was calling me to be a worshiper, and what that looked like. And so, as I started progressing even more uh, in my time, I started at UAM and started serving in the student ministry there. And even the student campus pastor, he would preach with no shoes on. And he said every time that he did, he stepped on holy ground and he didn't want to interrupt it with anything. And I was like, okay, wow, so here's another another step kind of going forward. And then uh, at that time, my mom ended up having a tumor. I came home from UAM after three semesters and began serving in my local church, taking what I learned from there to that. And that's where I probably fell and deeply and richly in love that worship encompassed my life. Um, I started working with the local worship pastor there, who I now call my best friend. And um, he developed, he poured into me, just teaching me things about uh, the applicational side of worship. But then I started to wonder, well, how did that line up? And remember that I'm, I'm kind of around that 20, 21 year of age right now. I, for so long, I heard people speak words into me teach me again my dad must have done as a pastor he was I heard the same sermon probably 36 times before any church member ever heard it and I heard it on a repeat about seven years later and so I was always having it but at that moment it was like let me let me figure out what that actually means let me figure out and that's when I started to dive into worship I started diving into word and understanding that the two coexist together into one and, and then before I found out I found to the simple thing of just going I'm singing word and so, as, as I started just progressing in that, I would say that that, um, that phrase changes a little bit. That greater knowledge will always produce deeper expressions of worship. And so, uh, since then, I, again, remember I surrendered to the ministry. I wanted to then influence and guide and lead people where others have gotten poured into me. And since then, I've, I've been equipping, equipping churches and, and every avenue and every opportunity of, of, of worship I can get my hands on, whether it's, you know, Kids Vacation Bible School, where we keep bubbling up, bubbling up, bubbling up, <laughs> or all the way to playing with a 200-piece choir and a 50-person orchestra, which is, you know, not my preference, but um, it's still worship, and I still chase it, so. Awesome. And truly that is, to learn to worship has to be a desire of yourself. I can honestly relate to being worship was that section of time that was just, I sat in the back of the room waiting for the guy to get up to speak mm. so I could see if I agreed with him or not. Yeah. <laughs> God had to do that work, right? And it's that work that he does in us to draw us closer to it. And when we learn it, it's a lot different than when we just simply say it which is great, which brings to the next thing of understanding when it comes to worship. There's many pieces and um, parts of this. So explain what we can to the folks and understand the difference between the heart and the art of worship. Well, I like the question because it's also the answer. You're right. The, the heart <laughs> is the art. Um, if you're on my worship team and you have signed the covenant, you've been a part of uh, my ministry for some amount of time, you'll know that heart always trumps talents, abilities, and anything else that comes along with it. Why? Because that can all be taught. Uh, the heart has to be centered and fixated on the worship of God. Um, now, for, I'm, I'm assuming the question is kind of a little more particulars of the matter. Is that correct? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the heart and the art. So, my, like I said, my first place is always to raise people up that posture themselves before the throne. Um, if, we're, if we're not there, then 
then everything we're doing is almost karaoke. Yeah. Um, I think a couple years ago, I, I had to sit down with our worship team and go, hey, listen, we have built some excellence. That's fine. That's beautiful. I want to build you leading, telling a story every time we speak a word, hanging on every word that we sing. Again, understanding that, uh, I will take a page from what you just said, that sometimes we don't always remember the sermon, but we always remember the songs. Mm -hmm. We're always singing them throughout the week. And so, um, for some people, music resonates a lot more deeply than anybody just sitting there with, the, with notes and speaking. And so, um, as far as the practical side of it, um, with this team, and, and even y'all, y'all heard me speak to this before, that y'all are part of the worship team. Y'all are worship leaders. You know, just the same way that you, you are called to be ministers of the gospel and to go and to spread the news, you are also called to be worshipers. And the scripture even tells us to teach and admonish one another through hymns, songs, and spiritual songs. So, you are all worship leaders. And so, to understand this, is that you even have a little bit of heaviness that comes with that. You have a little bit of responsibility that comes with that. That you are just like the Levitical priest when it came to the tabernacle. The Levitical priest set up between the tabernacle and the people. They set up and guarded, and then also set up the meeting place where people met with God. You are tasked to that, worship leaders. And so that is ultimately, if I can do that between from the platform within my ministry, uh -huh. then I'm doing my job as an overseer. Shepherd. Yes, and what I want to put to that is this goes for both of us, and what we do is to teach you mm -hmm. how to. So that's why it's not a show for worship, you know. They're not performing for you. They're they, leading you. They get a better worship pastor. Yes. If it was. True. Probably a prettier voice. Shorter prayers? Probably shorter prayers. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> Um, real quick, just to know, and that idea of the heart working through and different things, um, talk about being overcome and facing struggles when it comes to leading worship. Oh, hold on, I love it. When I saw this question, I was like, man, this is, this is a good one. Um, there's been multiple times throughout my life, but I actually started thinking a little more recently about my time here at Marshall Road. Um, and Marshall Road's got a special place in my heart because um, for the ones that know, you know. For the ones that are about to know, here it is. Um, Y'all didn't know this, but three years ago, uh, my, my biological father passed away, and he passed away at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning. I got through rehearsal and took a phone call, and it hit me. It hit me. I, I ended up, like, ended up, I still ended up prepping lyrics. I still ended up doing audio and blaring it for y'all Sunday school class so y'all could get a little, like, little taste of what is to come. And I was prepping and doing all the things, and I was just kind of shutting it off. And I think it came down to a moment where I just started to realize that that worship to God is even greater than, than my sadness in that moment, my anxiety. And so uh, we went into we went into back to pray, and I almost just kind of shared the news. Everybody kind of came around me and was praying over me, and I just finally said, "I'm okay." And I got up on this platform and I worshiped. And it's why? Because even though my sadness and something that's so temporary is so little compared to the vastness and the glory of God, Amen. that I need to put that on display Amen. above myself. Amen. Amen. So with that, we'll close up with this last one. And that is, what is your biggest joy in leading worship? Leading for y'all. <laughs> um, no, I love, I, I absolutely find it a joy um, I think Terry can attest because I usually, I usually, like kind of move this way in this direction, and we always usually whoever's right here usually makes eye contact. Nadar is in the same category too. That I usually make eye contact and I smile really big. And it's actually when I hear y'all, when I hear the church sing in one unison voice, man, y'all, y'all, y'all make my day because that is God's people being unified, giving glory to the Creator. Man, let me tell you, gooses, gooses. <laughs> Awesome. And with that, like we've had the conversation and asked like what classifies good worship. Both of us are on the same page. It could be a song that's 500 years old that's right. and a song that's five minutes old. Yeah. We're going to sing to worship and it's going to reflect the characteristics that we talked about today. 
Is it going to help us remember who God is and what he's done for us? Are we going to learn about him and are we going to see his power released in that? And that's what it comes down to, worship and why we sing. I, I want to read this quote. Okay. Um, worship or prayer, whether it's spoken or sung, is always and ever response to a, to a person. Steaming from the, recon the recognition that worship and prayer are both personal and relationally oriented is the conclusion that the authenticity and the validity of worship in the community directly corresponds to the accuracy and the depth of its knowledge of God. Amen. So with that, we get a unique privilege as we have talked about one of the things that God has directed the church to do is partake in communion. And it's kind of great that it mashed up today with worship and our singing because truly communion is a time to reflect on what God has done for us to go back and to look at the cross and to remember his body that was broken for us, his blood that was shed that we represent with the elements of the bread and the cup of the juice. It's this time. So right now we're going to get a special treat because we're going to go into worship. But this worship is you get your elements and you go back to your seat as we talked about. Don't just sit there and put your head down. If you're a Christian, remember what God's done for you. Praise him. Ask him for guidance even in the tough situations that you're in right now and draw closer to him. If you're not a Christian, don't partake. Remember, that's not an element for you. The penalty in that for that is way severe. But instead, what you can do is you can make a decision. If you've been wavering on what to do and you want to follow or not follow, know this is the time you can learn to follow Christ. Put him as Lord and Savior of your life. The simply you acknowledge him, as Romans says, confess with your mouth and believe with your heart. He is Lord. And then take the direction to go that way. And then you can partake of communion. So in this time, we're going to have some worship, have the time to reflect and to draw near, and you guys can gather your elements as we go forward with the service. And I will pray us into that part. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity as we get to learn and to draw into what you would have for each and every one of us, Lord. And right now, as we get to worship and just draw near to you and remember through communion what you did sending your son to take our place, Lord. We want to reflect in that. So pray for each and every one. pray for each and every one of us that you would just bring us to that place where we could be before you. We can reflect, remember, and truly draw closer to you, Lord. And those that are on the fence or wavering, Lord, I pray that you'd be with their hearts right now. I pray that you would set them on the right course for what you would have that would be best for them, Lord. So Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name.